All right, so I want to welcome everyone back. This is going to be our very first screencast for Chapter 10. And as most of you know, this week has been kind of a tough week. I've been sick for most of the week, so I'm going to do my best to make my way through the screencast. Um, if you have any questions, of course, about the content, make sure that you come in and see me. Um, and I'll do my best to try to clarify whatever I'm not able to make clear as we make our way through this. And so if you notice on the screen, we're going to be talking about a topic that is probably very familiar to most of you. Um, this is going to be photosynthesis. So back in Honors Bio, of course, we had talked about photosynthesis and we had talked about two different types of reactions. One of those reactions was the light reaction and the second in Honors Bio was called the dark reactions. What you're going to find out in um, AP Bio is that we no longer refer to that as the set of dark reactions. Now we talk about something called the Calvin cycle. And um, that's the way I would like you to refer to it as we kind of make our way through this chapter. All right, so again, this is just going to be sort of an overview of the process. And uh, remember that when you talk about photosynthesis, it's a very, very important process when it comes down to life on this planet. Um, sometimes scientists will sort of refer to this process as the process that actually feeds the biosphere. Um, what photosynthesis is there to do is simply to convert solar energy into a form of chemical energy. And the form of chemical energy is going to be kind of trapped within the glucose molecule that plants are going to produce as a byproduct of this process. And of course that glucose is going to be broken down by not only plants but um, animals of course as well and it's going to be converted into something called ATP and that's what we just looked at um, in chapter 9 when we discussed cell respiration. So if you notice the second bullet says directly or indirectly photosynthesis is going to nourish almost the entire living world. And that's kind of what I just mentioned. So if you are a plant, you are directly using the process of photosynthesis to be able to create the glucose that you're going to use as food. If you are using photosynthesis indirectly, well, of course, that would mean that you're an animal and you are having to eat the plants or eat the animals that actually eat plants to be able to get the um, benefits of photosynthesis. So back in Honors Bio, we had talked about two different groups of organisms on this planet. One of those was called an autotroph. And remember, autotrophs basically will be those types of organisms that can sustain themselves without actually consuming or eating anything. In other words, they don't have to eat another organism. Um, autotrophs are sometimes called producers. And what they do is they produce organic molecules from CO2 and other types of inorganic molecules that are found on this planet. So almost all plants are considered photoautotrophs, which basically means they're considered producers that are going to utilize light energy um, to be able to make organic molecules. So they're going to use the light along with some H2O, some water, and CO2 um, to be able to produce the food that they make, the food that we benefit from. So photosynthesis is going to occur in plants, of course. It's going to occur in most algae. There are some protist, single-cell creatures out there, which will um, basically photosynthesize. And there are some prokaryotes, so some bacteria-like organisms that will photosynthesize as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So these organisms feed not only um, themselves, but again, as we had said earlier, they also feed most of the living things that are found on this planet. Now the second group is going to be called the heterotrophs. And remember the heterotrophs are going to be those that actually obtain their organic material from other organisms. Basically meaning that they must consume um, other organisms in the biosphere to be able to um, get the nutrients that they need to be able to survive. Almost all heterotrophs, and that does include us, we are considered heterotrophs, are going to depend on the photoautotrophs for food and they're going to depend on these um, autotrophs or photoautotrophs for oxygen as well. Now remember how important oxygen was. That was going to be the molecule that was going to allow um, cellular respiration, aerobic cellular respiration to occur, which basically means allow us to be able to break down the food that we consume so we can extract the energy and create the ATP that our cells need. So when it comes down to photosynthesis, again, we're going to be converting light energy to chemical energy. Now in order to be able to do that we need to have a structure um, that's going to be able to collect that light energy. 
And as most of you already know, in plants, that special structure is called a chloroplast. And if you notice, it says chloroplasts are structurally similar to and likely evolved from very special photosynthetic bacteria many, many millions of years ago. So the structural organization of these cells is going to allow for the chemical reactions of photosynthesis to occur. And remember, those um, chemical reactions are going to fall into two categories. And the first one is going to be the light reactions. And again, that second set of reactions is going to be the Calvin cycle. Now, the leaves are going to be the major part of the plant that is going to participate in photosynthesis. Now, remember that the green color that you see in most plants is going to come from a very special pigment called chlorophyll. And um, this chlorophyll actually comes in two forms. It's going to be chlorophyll A, and it's going to be found as chlorophyll B. And we'll talk a little bit more about those two different types of chlorophyll pigments a little bit later. Light energy, again, is going to be absorbed by this chlorophyll, this pigment that you find inside of the chloroplast, and that's going to drive the synthesis of these organic molecules inside of the chloroplast. And again, that primary organic molecule that we're looking for is that glucose molecule that we're going to eventually use as a food source and break down to create the ATP that we need to survive. So CO2 is a very important part when it comes down to photosynthesis. And um, in order to obtain that CO2, we're going to need a special structure on the leaf, which is called a stomata. And a stomata is just a very tiny opening that you would find in that leaf. And that stomata can actually open and close based on what that um, plant needs in terms of photosynthesis. But not only does CO2 enter the plant through the stomata, but the O2 that's produced during photosynthesis also exits through the um, stomata as well. So as I had said, the um, chloroplast is the um, very important part of a plant cell that's going to participate in photosynthesis. These chloroplasts are found mainly in the cells of the mesophyll of the um, interior tissue of the leaf. And so over here on the right, you can see that mesophyll right there. So this would be sort of a blown up version of that leaf. And actually you can see the stomata right here. So that would be those tiny openings where CO2 can enter and O2 can actually leave. A typical mesophyll cell is gonna have about 30 to 40 chloroplasts per cell. So the chlorophyll is in the membranes of um, the thylakoids. So we're gonna, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to sort of make sure that we understand the structure of a chloroplast. And the pigment that we just referred to, that chlorophyll, is going to be found in these very um, kind of very tiny, small, flattened structures called thylakoids. And we looked at these back in Honors Bio. Um, these thylakoids are connected and typically stacked on top of each other. And when they're stacked on top of each other, what we do is we give them a special name, and they're called granum. Um, sometimes they'll refer to them as grana or granum, so either one is going to be correct. So in addition to the thylakoids, we also need to make sure that we understand that there's this very fluid space on the outside of the um, thylakoids, and that's going to be called the stroma. So that's the dense fluid that you see right out here. Now, like we had done in cellular respiration, what we're going to need to do in photosynthesis is we also need to make sure that we sort of keep track of where the atoms are going within the different um, elements of the um, photosynthetic process. Now, as we've seen back in um, regular biology or honors bio, this is going to be the um, generalized equation for photosynthesis. And so if you notice on the left-hand side, we need to have a good source of CO2. Of course, we need to have a good source of water. Um, the light energy in most cases is going to come from the sun. So these are going to be considered our reactants. And if you look over here on the right-hand side, you're going to notice that we have, of course, C6H12O6 being produced. Then we have um, also oxygen, of course, which is what we're going to use to breathe. Now, you're also going to notice something a little bit different, um, maybe from the equation that you learned back in Honors Bio. You'll notice that water also shows up on the right-hand side of this um, generalized equation. Well, one of the reasons we do that is because, actually, if you notice, on the left-hand side, what normally would be a 6 is actually a 12. And what we do in the equation that you were taught in Honors Bio is that um, we sort of don't have this um, extra water on the right-hand side, and we don't have it because we account for it on the left-hand side. So in other words, what we would do is we take the 12 minus the 6, 
And in the equation that we learned back in Honors Bio, it would be 6CO2, 6H2O plus light energy is going to give us glucose plus 6O2. So don't get too confused about what you see over here on the right. I know it's kind of strange to have water over here, but it's kind of like what that net gain would have been if we take that 6 away from that 12. So don't get too confused by that. So if you notice, the chloroplast is going to split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And this is going to incorporate the electrons of hydrogen into the sugar molecules that we need to produce on the right-hand side. So again, looking at the reactants, this is what you would find on the left. The 6CO2, you can sort of see where the C's are going. So the carbon is going to be, of course, contributed to the um, glucose molecule. We have oxygen that's going to be contributed to the glucose as well as the um, water that you see over here. Then you'll notice that um, for the water that was put into the system, the hydrogens are going to be contributed to the extra water and, of course, the glucose. And then if you notice, we have the oxygens. And again, it's going to um, be contributed to the oxygen that's going to be produced by the plant that we use to be able to breathe. Now, photosynthesis is considered a redox process. Now, don't get confused by that because we had learned about redox processes back in Chapter 9. And so in this case, the H2O is going to be oxidized and the CO2 is going to be the um, compound that's going to be reduced in this equation. So as I had said a little bit earlier, there are two stages when it comes down to photosynthesis, and I'm just going to give you a quick preview of those two stages. So again, we have the light reactions, and we have the second stage, which is called the um, Calvin cycle. And so the light reactions are considered the photo part. In other words, it's going to be utilizing the light in the um, process of photosynthesis. The Calvin cycle, on the other hand, is not going to really need the um, participation of the light, so it's considered the synthesis part, and to synthesize means to make something. So we're going to be making that really important um, glucose component during the Calvin cycle. So the light reactions, again, are going to take place in the thylakoids. So remember those thylakoids were those green discs that I had showed you a little bit earlier. And you can see the thylakoids right here in this diagram. So the um, main purpose of the light reactions is to split the H2O, like we had looked at in the previous screen, release O2, so that's going to be one of the products of the light reactions. It's going to reduce NADP plus um, to NADPH, and if you notice, this is very similar to the NAD plus and NADH that we had looked at in cellular respiration. It does exactly the same thing that that molecule had done in cellular respiration. It's going to act as an electron carrier. And that's going to become um, really important when we looked at each of these different um, um, stages of photosynthesis a little bit later. It's going to generate ATP from ADP by the idea of photophosphorylation. Now remember, phosphorylation is simply the movement of that phosphate to ADP to create that ATP molecule. Now, the Calvin cycle, which is going to take place in the stroma, so it's going to be that fluid-filled space on the outside of the thylakoids, is going to be used to basically form, again, that glucose, that sugar, from the CO2 by using ATP and the NADPH that was produced during the light reactions. So the Calvin cycle is going to begin with something called carbon fixation which we sort of illustrated that in the previous screen where it talked about incorporating that CO2, those two different types of atoms, into the organic molecules that we are producing as our product on the right-hand side of that photosynthetic, photosynthetic equation. So remember that the light reactions of photosynthesis are going to convert solar energy to chemical energy. And again, that chemical energy is going to be in the form of ATP and NADPH. Sometimes they refer to the chloroplast as a solar-powered chemical factory. Their thylakoids are going to transform the light energy into the chemical energy, again, of ATP and NADPH. Light is going to be in the form of something called electromagnetic energy. Sometimes they'll refer to it as electromagnetic radiation. And like other types of energy, this light is going to travel in rhythmic waves. And sometimes we will use the term wavelength to um, identify the distance between the crests of those waves. And so this would be considered a wave. And so the wavelength is going to be the difference 
or excuse me, the distance between those two crests. So the wavelength is going to determine the type of electromagnetic energy that we're working with. And I'm going to show you a diagram in a second that's going to sort of illustrate that. Now the diagram I just mentioned is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is going to show you the entire range of the electromagnetic energy or radiation that we had just mentioned. Now visible light um, is going to consist of wavelengths, and, and again that's going to be those some um, wavelengths that also drive photosynthesis that produce the colors that we actually can see, and so that visible light is going to be responsible for that. Light also is going to behave as though it consists of very discrete particles called photons, and those are going to become important as we um, start talking about the um, different um, processes that occur within photosynthesis. So this is the um, electromagnetic spectrum that um, I was referring to in the previous screen. So if you notice, this very narrow area that you see right here, that's going to represent the visible light that's found within this entire um, spectrum. And it goes from the far left of gamma rays all the way to the far right, which is the radio waves. And so this is the um, area of the spectrum that we're actually um, concerned with. And if you notice, um, there's different colors associated with these different numbers which identify where you're at within that visible spectrum. So shorter wavelengths are going to be on the far left and longer wavelengths are going to be on the far right. Higher energy is going to be found over here. The longer wavelengths tend to have a lower amount of energy. And so as I had said, in order for um, photosynthesis to be able to take place, we need to um, know that there are various different types of pigments that are going to be found within the um, leaf of the plant. And these pigments are going to be responsible for absorbing that visible part of that electromagnetic spectrum. So different pigments are going to absorb different wavelengths. And so the different colors that I had showed you on the previous screen um, are going to be absorbed by different types of pigments found within the plant. Um, wavelengths that are not absorbed are going to be reflected or transmitted. In other words, those are going to be the wavelengths that we can actually see with our eyes. Leaves appear green because chlorophyll um, basically reflects or transmits the green light that you would find in that visible spectrum. So an absorption spectrum is going to be sort of a different way to look at that electromagnetic spectrum as it pertains to plants. And so this is going to be a graph that's going to plot a pigment's light absorption versus the wavelength or the color that we would see in that spectrum. And the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A, so now we're referring to those different types of chlorophyll, is going to suggest that violet, blue, and red light is going to work best for photosynthesis. And so over here on the right, if you notice, chlorophyll A is identified right here and it's going to be this kind of light blue line that you see here. If you notice, it's pretty high in the violet or purple range. It kind of comes down when you look at the blue to green to yellow. But then it sort of spikes again in the orange to red range. And so that's where um, the most absorption is going to take place of that visible light. Um, an action spectrum is going to profile the relative effectiveness of the different wavelengths of radiation in driving a certain process. So in other words, the ability of it to actually drive the process of photosynthesis. And again, if you notice, it's pretty high here within this area and pretty high also, as I had said, in this area of the um, of the spectrum. So chlorophyll A is considered the main photosynthetic pigment when you talk about the pigments that participate in photosynthesis. Now it's not the um, only one that participates, but it is the main one. There are other pigments, and we identify them as accessory pigments, um, and one of those would be chlorophyll B, and that sort of broadens the spectrum used for photosynthesis, so it gives them more opportunities to be able to absorb that light. Some accessory pigments are called keratinoids, and these are going to absorb um, actually excessive light that could possibly damage um, the chlorophyll. So they have sort of an additional factor um, that allows them to do something else for the plant in, in regards to not only um, the process of photosynthesis, but making sure that that chlorophyll remains intact and can actually do its job. So one thing we need to think about when it comes down to chlorophyll is um, sort of what happens within that molecule. So when a pigment absorbs light, it's going to go from something called the ground state to something called the excited state, which is going to be considered the unstable state 
of the um, of the situation or the process. So over here on the right, it's, these, it's probably easier just to sort of explain using the diagram as to what we're talking about here. So remember we had talked about those little particles of light being called photons. And when they come into the leaf of the plant, remember they're going to strike um, basically those thylakoids. And within those thylakoids, you're going to find that chlorophyll molecule. So this is going to be the pigment. When it strikes this chlorophyll molecule, there's electrons found within um, the structure of this chlorophyll molecule. And so these electrons are normally in the ground state and they're going to be pushed into the excited state. And so what that means is if you think about um, just a generalized atom, and so we'll just say atom X, and so this would be the nucleus, so that's where the protons and the neutrons are. Remember that we have these um, shells or these orbitals on the outside and what's happening is if the electron is here that is considered the ground state if it gets excited we push it out to these outside levels and that's considered the excited state and when it does that um, what's going to happen is we're going to get the release of a little bit of energy and that energy is going to be released in the form of heat and it's also actually going to be released um, in the form of light as well and so when this is occurring you can see um, some solutions that may have this pigment that's been exposed to light it's going to produce a fluorescence in other words it's going to glow which kind of gives you an indicator that these electrons are moving from the ground state to the um, excited state so when we talk about um, the light reactions, what we need to do is we need to think about the light reactions, which again is one of those two stages of, of um, photosynthesis. We need to think about those light reactions as actually occurring within um, two different types of um, what we call photosystems. Um, we have something called photosystem one and photosystem two. Now a photosystem is simply um, a reaction center complex that's going to be surrounded by light harvesting um, complexes. So over here on the right, this whole thing is considered a photosystem. And if you notice, there's lots of different parts that um, sort of come with this photosystem. If you notice, the photon, which again is going to be the light particle being released by the light or the sun, is going to come into this photosystem, which is, if you notice, just a big protein that's embedded within the membrane of that thylakoid when it comes in it actually strikes these green spheres and these green spheres are going to be that chlorophyll pigment as it strikes these um, green spheres remember it's going to take that electron from the ground state to the excited state and we're not going to actually pass the electron but we're going to get the result of that excitation of that electron and that energy is going to be transferred from pigment molecule to pigment molecule within this protein Eventually, that is going to end up right here with this special pair of chlorophyll pigments called chlorophyll A. So these right here are not considered chlorophyll A, but these two that you see right here within this reaction center complex are. And so what happens is the electrons that you see within these particular molecules are going to be taken and moved to something called the primary electron acceptor. And once it does that, then it's going to basically um, accept that excited electron, as we had said, from chlorophyll A. So basically, the um, transfer of an electron from a chlorophyll A molecule to that primary electron acceptor, so this little square area that you see right here, is going to be the very first step of the light reactions. And so we'll get into more detail when we talk about, um, again, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, um, probably in the next video for chapter 10. All right, so before we wrap this up, again, as I had said in the previous screen, there are going to be two different types of photosystems that's going to be found in the thylakoid membrane. And um, again, remember these photosystems are part of the light reactions in the process of photosynthesis. The first one is going to be called photosystem 2, and the second is going to be called photosystem 1. Now, I know that seems kind of strange to have photosystem 2 before photosystem 1, but the number that you see right here simply reflects the order of discovery. And so actually, this one was discovered first, but this one was discovered second, but this one actually occurs first when you're talking about the light reactions in photosynthesis. And photosystem 2 is going to be best at absorbing the wavelength of around 680 nanometers. And so that's going to be the um, wavelengths we saw on the far right of that electromagnetic spectrum in the visible light range of that spectrum. 
So the reaction center chlorophyll A of photosystem 2 is going to be called P680. And again, that 680 simply refers to the wavelength that we're using um, during that stage of um, the light reactions. Photosystem 1 is going to be best at absorbing a wavelength of around 700 nanometers. And so the reaction center, chlorophyll A of PS1, is going to be called P700. So again, that 700 simply refers to that wavelength found within that visible spectrum that we had talked about a little bit earlier. All right, so that's going to finish up our very first video for Chapter 10. Again, I do appreciate you guys bearing with me as I made my way through this. Again, as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide that goes along with this video.